When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And my name is Brian Colbert Kennedy. There's the energy we're looking for. Woo! This is the podcast where we try to bend the motherfucking arc of history towards a more livable planet for you, for me, and for everyone else. We're going to dive into a specific question affecting everyone on the planet right now. Mm-hmm. If it can kill us or make the future a hell of a lot cooler, and this is the key for everyone, everyone. we are it. Our guests have been scientists, doctors, engineers, politicians, astronauts. We had a reverend. Farmers. Farmers. Mm -hmm. And we work together toward action steps that our listeners can take with their voice and their vote and their dollar. Mm -hmm. This is your friendly reminder that you can send questions, thoughts, and feedback to us on Twitter at ImportantNotImp, or you can email us at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. And you can also join tens of thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter, at importantnotimportant.com. Mm -hmm. And finally, if you are interested in hearing the show without ads, understandable. Sure. If you would like a five-minute audio version of our weekly newsletter read by Brian. Hey! And if you enjoy our Fun Talk episodes, you can actually support our work for the first time for just five bucks a month at importantnotimportant.com slash shitgiver. Thank you. Thank you. This week's episode asks what we can do to support the black farmers who have the ancient answers to rebuilding our soil and farms and food systems. They've been here the whole time. Our guest is the magnificent Leah Penniman, and we're going to talk about uh, her book, Farming While Black, uh, her story, and how she's building something very, very special in freezing cold upstate New York. Yeah. It is a new start, and it is built on some very, very old and thankfully proven foundations. We all benefit from her incredible work. Awesome conversation. Um, let's get right to it. Okay, let's talk to Leah. Our guest today is Leah Penniman, and together we're going to talk about farming while black, the past and the future. Leah, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. For sure. We are excited to have you and have this conversation, so thank you. If we can uh, just get started by uh, give everybody like a little a quick intro of who you are and what you do. Sure thing. Uh, well, I'm up here in the snowy mountains of Grafton, New York at Soldier <laughs> Farm. We're on 80 acres in Mohican territory, and we are dedicated to ending racism and injustice in the food system. So we're producing you know, food and medicine, distributing that to people who need it in our community, and also training up the next generation of black and brown farmers. I love that. No, yeah. no small feet. No small feet. We keep pretty busy <laughs> around here. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I'm sure. I'm sure. As a, as a reminder to everyone, and Leah, so you know, our goal, uh, you know, is to provide uh, some quick context for um, the question or the topic at hand for today. And then uh, we're going to dig into some action-oriented questions that get to the uh, core of, of why we should all give a shit about it and you and what we can all do about it. Does that sound great? I am definitely in favor of giving a shit. So yeah, let's go. Yes. Rock and roll. Uh, awesome. So Leah, we start with one important question to sort of set the tone of things. Instead of uh, asking you for your, uh, to go over your entire life story, as amazing as I'm sure that might be, we like to ask, Leah, why are you vital to the survival of the species? <laughs> well, I actually don't have such an inflated opinion of myself as to think that I as an in individual are vital. But I will say that our work at Soul Fire Farm and by extension, this whole food sovereignty movement is absolutely essential. Uh, we all eat. Uh, we pretty much all live on land unless you happen to be in a boat. Uh, and right now, as you know, our, our food system is really in crisis. Our topsoil is uh, flowing into the oceans. Our climate is in chaos. 
Uh, we have pesticide resistant uh, bugs proliferating. We have a, a loss of insects and biodiversity. And then, of course, our farm workers are being treated like crap. Our, our farmers are losing their land and the people who need the food the most aren't getting it. And so our food system is absolutely in crisis and it's essential that everybody uh, learns about it and cares about it so that we can survive. Yeah, that sounds pretty straightforward to me. Bam. Yeah. Everybody eats. Everybody, everybody eats. eats in the soil. If I could just quickly comment, you said everybody eats and lives on land or on a boat. And I, I don't know if you've listened to any of our fun talks, but I, there was a time when I was trying to live in space. And so if there's anybody out there living in space. <laughs> yeah, but that didn't work. No, I know it didn't work. It didn't work out, but I just didn't want. Work out. Yeah. Yeah. For now, we all it out there. Fly on the land. point, the, the for point here, land. Brian, you're stuck with us. Leah's right. I was just saying Leah's right. Yeah, of course she is. All right. So Leah, what I'm going to do is a, I usually do a quick look again, like one minute context for everybody to get up speed. And sometimes that's super technical. And it's like, what is leukemia or how does air pollution work before we get into the questions? Or sometimes it's ethical or whatever it might be. Uh, this time, I, I just because of what we're going to get in today and the fact that it's uh, two white guys in Los Angeles uh, talking to you, I, I want to be sort of specifically personal about it real quick, um, which is to preface this by publicly acknowledging for anyone that's new here uh, that that uh, I and Brian, we are upper middle class Los Angeles, you know, cis white men. Yep. Um, my direct ancestors, uh, as far as I can tell from the online things that are going to steal all my information, mm -hmm. mostly came from Ireland and France and Scotland and the Netherlands a little further back, ranging from early 1600s to the mid 19th and early 20th centuries. They, they were, as far as I've been able to tell, variations on European white. Yeah. Um, I'm from Virginia, uh, Williamsburg, just down the street from, uh, from Jamestown, founded in 1607, which was the first permanent English colony in the Americas. And of course, that means simultaneously some of the first permanent stolen lands uh, from the Powhatan people to be specific. And they <laughs> branched on out from there. Uh, the first tobacco was planted a few years after that. African slaves showed up in 1619 and the rest is history. Their plan uh, worked. I have been um, lucky uh, to learn from a distance that is my my livelihood and my food security were never really threatened as our country was built on farmlands that were stolen from first generations people that was worked by African slaves and that we've eventually now <laughs> destroyed along the way with monocrops and industrial agriculture. And so we, uh, white folks, we, we designed and built the system like we eventually designed and built the prison industrial complex. Uh, and along the way, not only did we enslave African people and build our entire economy on their broken backs. We brought in millions of, of uh, Latinx people to uh, plant and grow and pick and serve our food. Um, nearly all of our land, as far as I've been able to find out, is still owned by white people while worked mostly by non-white people. Um, so when, when people ask, like, why do we have conversations like this? It's because Black Lives Matter, because Black Farmers matter. Um, and on an even grander scale, because we care so much about climate change and the future in the next chapter of uh, American history and world history, which just it can't look anything like the first chapters. And because we have to fix our soil and we have to fix our food system. And, and because we specifically need to humble ourselves before people like yourselves who combine ancient farming methods uh, with progressive plans uh, for the future. So I, I can't imagine a world where I could do enough to rectify our history. So of course, we started a podcast. And so I just want to listen and learn as much as I can uh, to have a conversation like we always try to do, because if we cannot use this platform for conversations like this, uh, if we can't try to be allies, I'm frankly not sure what it's for. So before we even get into this, I just want to thank Leah for taking the time to specifically talk to us today. And that's right what I got. thanks for that accountable introduction. I really appreciate it. Yeah, for I mean, uh, that that's the that's the point, right? We need to be honest and transparent if we're going to move this thing forward. So, uh, let's talk about farming while black. Um, something uh, I will never directly experience, but I really, really want to understand. Uh, Leah, the first words in your book are: "This book is dedicated to our ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds in their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships." leaving against in the, in the odds in a future of sovereignty on land. 
I want to go back to the first time you you heard that. Tell me how old you were and and where it came from and how it affected you. Oh my, it was actually pretty recent that I started to dig into Black agrarian history. Uh, Like so many of us, you know, I've I've been farming for over 20 years. And when I went to conferences and, uh, you know, read books, they were pretty much all written by, led by white men. And I assumed erroneously that anything that mattered in terms of organic and regenerative ag came from European folks. And it wasn't until I started teaching here at Soul Fire Farm, uh, pri- primarily uh, folks from the Black community, the Latinx and Indigenous community, that I, I knew I needed to uncover a different narrative. It, it could not be possible that, you know, the only relationship we had with farming and land was uh, through enslavement and sharecropping. Uh, so I just started with a hypothesis uh, that Black farmers matter and dug into the literature, dug into the anthropology journals, um, started asking elders. And of course, you know, that history was right there, ready to be uncovered. Um, specifically the story of braiding seeds into, uh, our ancestors braiding seeds into their hair. I first uncovered from Judith Carney's work. She wrote a book called Black Rice that talks about mm-hmm. the Mende and Wallaf people and their contribution to uh, rice agriculture in the Carolinas. Um, and then I, I asked elders in my own family about this and they said, oh yeah, you know, of course we, um, that's how we got our seeds over here. We hit them in our braids. That's incredible. It, that was, that's wild. That's amazing. Yeah, it's so powerful because I think, you know, it's very easy for me. I'm disillusioned all the time and I, I often feel hopeless and what's the point of busting ass if we're going to lose anyway. And then I think about, <laughs> you know, my grandma's grandma's grandma in the shores of the Dahomey region, West Africa, being faced with kidnapping and, and being forced right. into some ship. And if she could put seeds in her hair and have that kind of hope, like who am I to then give up on our descendants um, in this time? Right. It's, it's one of those, it's all relative kind of things. Mm-hmm. Right. I think we've had a, f- had a few conversations and had some and offline conversations and such with, with, you know, uh, people of color who have been very happy to educate us that, uh, and, and rightfully so that they're glad we're finally marching in the streets for this, our very first existential crisis. Uh, well, well they have been doing it all along. Mm-hmm. And uh, it does it does put things uh, in context quite a bit. So so how you've been farming for twenty something years? Did that reframe anything for you? Did that reinvigorate you? How how did that become part of your your teaching? Oh, it absolutely did. I mean, I started farming when I was sixteen years old, and it was really because of a, a simple and passionate love of the earth. I wanted to do something that helped the planet because the planet was my my true friend, you know, we as uh, brown skinned kids growing up mostly in a rural white town, it was, uh, let's say peer relationships were challenging to be generous. I mean, there was just ample racial, racialized bullying and, and farming was that for me um, with the bonus that I could help out the human community. But I started to really feel like a race trader, uh, maybe seven to 10 years into that and wondering if I should use my strong back and intelligent mind in, in some field that's more relevant, like housing discrimination or, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, the broken public school system, something like that. And it, it was meeting Karen Washington, uh, who is a national leader in the black farming movement, a farmer at rising. She's amazing. She's so, so badass. She's on our board now, which I'm very excited about, you know, but she's the one who encouraged me to, to keep going and to start to suggest a reframe. Uh, that that really there was dignity in farming and that it wasn't that our ancestors would roll ro- over in their graves when they saw us stooping. It's that they would be proud of us for reclaiming a noble heritage. That's pretty great. So Where cool. And I know we literally said, you know, we don't want you to have to dive into your entire life story, but n- now I'm curious. So where, I know you spent some time in Boston, um, where, when you started to dig your hands into the soil at 16, where were you? What prompted that? Was your immediate family... Uh, uh, did they work in farming? Were they were they just soil people? How did that get started? Soil people? <laughs> no, my my family was definitely not farmers. Um, so my mom lived in the Bo- my parents were split. My mom who's black, she lived in the Boston area. My dad lived in Ashburnham, Mass. And so I spent okay. the summers in an urban environment, and that's where I I saw the flyer at church for the food project and applied and was lucky enough to to get that job. You know, but like so many so many families, you know, our story is one of the the great migration. Our grandparents fled the red clays of Georgia and the Carolinas uh, for a better life, you know, to escape racial terrorism and to try to get some factory job in Pittsburgh or Boston. You know, my grandfather, who's Haitian, similarly fled the countryside and the Tontomoku and all the oppression that was going on there and became an engineer. So uh, there was a dissonance uh, because it seemed like the trajectory should be uh, to embrace those paved streets of the urban north and I was going back to soil. I love that. 
How did you find your way up to uh, to Central New York? Where I went to um, Colgate University, which is I think is a couple hours away from you, which is super duper cold. Um, not that Boston isn't, but how, how did you find your way up there? Yeah, well, I'm in the same climate that I grew up in. I'm I'm pretty attached to the Northeast. Actually, I really like these rugged, uh, worn down, rocky areas and so forth. But um, mm-hmm. the reason we left Massachusetts and moved just two hours west to the Albany area was mostly for affordability of land. Uh, we wanted to be farmers and you know, didn't have any inheritance or you know, trust funds or anything like that. So we had to make do. And um, upstate New York still, you know, you can get land for $2,000 an acre and parcels 100 acres plus because it's right. remote. How big did you say your farm is? Our farm is 80 acres. Damn. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the 40 acres and a mule doubled. <laughs> <It's the interesting>. <laughs> <laughs> and you actually have it as opposed to everyone else who just didn't get it. Right. And it wasn't that it was given to us as an act of well, operations. You know, I, right. I was, I've been a public school teacher for 17 years, give or take. And, you know, we bought the land by putting aside part of my teaching salary and borrowing money from family and friends. So bit by bit. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit about about the the setup of of Soul Fire Farms and I guess the curriculum. Uh, paint, paint a sort of picture for us on how everything works. Sure. Uh, so there's eight of us who are you know crazy enough to cast our oh. lot here in the hills, <laughs> and uh, uh, I I love the team that we work with. Really, really blessed, um, and definitely want to shout them out. It's not a solo uh, project at all, and. You know, depending on the season, it looks really different. Uh, but during the growing season, which for us is April to November, uh, you can regularly see between 25 and 150 people here out on the land for some kind of learning opportunity. So our most popular program is the week-long Soul Fire Farming Immersion, which brings folks from over 40 states and oftentimes a couple countries. It is for Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, who want to farm. And so we wake up at six in the morning, go outside and uh, nourish the plants before we nourish ourselves. So we're um, taking care of the land. We eat food together. We learn all the farming skills you need from seed to harvest to market, as well as the history of our our people's noble and dignified contributions to regenerative ag and their resistance to land-based oppression. And there's a whole lot of culturally relevant uh, activities. So we've got you know, griot style storytelling and drumming and dancing and New Orleans funerals, wow. barrier trauma. And it's lit. It's really lit. And then our alumni are forever part of our network of support. And so we have all kinds of mentorship and land link programs and funding available to support our alums and getting started with their own farms. Is it pretty competitive to, to squeeze into that week? It's not competitive in the sense of a meritocracy, uh, but just because there's so much interest in the program, we have to figure out how to, you know, narrow down the hundreds of applicants to the hundreds. Right, I meant that, yeah, capacity-wise. Yeah, capacity-wise. So that's been heartbreaking for us, actually, um, as much as it's invigorating. And so part of our program is a train the trainer, because our hope is that, you know, more and more programs like Soul Fire Farm that are locally adapted will be popping up all around the country so that... uh, People don't have to travel from California to New York to learn how to farm. They can, you know, go right around the corner to their own version of Soul Fire. You 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 like house everybody and everything? We do. Yeah. So we have yeah. dormitory and campgrounds and you know, it's pretty rustic and, and yeah, yeah. DIY, cool. you know, like bucket shower style and outdoor kitchen. Yeah. Uh, as we've grown, I will say that the Rensselaer County Health Department has been paying closer to attention and <laughs> of, of raising the necessary funds to upgrade the facilities to commercial standards. And so there'll be um, some big changes happening at Soul Fire over the next 18 months. Do you guys operate wow. as a nonprofit or? Yeah, we have two legal entities. So the land is owned by a housing cooperative. Um, so the people who live on the land uh, follow a one member, one vote protocol for making decisions about how the land is used. And one of those members and tenants is the nonprofit Soul Fire Farm Institute, which, you know, it sounds a little complicated because white man's law is just complicated. It's really just <sighs> us on the land, but Sorry. the nonprofit it houses the educational programming. So you talked about training the trainers. What, what have you, how long has Soul Fire been up and running now? Oh, we're just about 10 years old. We opened um, fall of 2010. So cool. what, what about you know, again, dealing with laws and health codes and and capacity issues and things like that as you train the trainers and think about this uh, this w- wonderful thing branching out what what have you learned where what would you 
what would you be able to replicate? What would you choose to replicate? And what would you do differently as you encourage these things to to sprout on their own? Hmm. That's such a good question. And, you know, I think I'm even challenged by the concept or idea of replication because I really, I think it, it would be terrifying to franchise something that really has grown out of a local community's passion, needs, demands, interests. And I, I believe that every locality is different and, and mm-hmm. to grow its own food sovereignty project in a different way. You know, at the same time, just like a big grandma pine tree in the forest that's got access to a whole bunch of extra sunlight and, and consequently can make extra sugars, uh, doesn't decide to grow three times taller than everyone else, but rather shares the sugars and supports uh, you know, the whole super organism of the forest to grow, we really think of soul fire as, as that tree and trying to figure out how to make sure that whatever lessons learned and resources we have are shared among our community. And that includes avoid, you know, don't go, don't make the same mistake that we made. Um, and one of, <laughs> one of the mistakes that we did make was probably, yeah, under budgeting for, uh, infrastructure and not thinking fully through, uh, the ways that we need to care for people's physical needs when they're here. And I think, I think we could have got, a, got ahead of that. But then again, we wouldn't have been able to accept so many people to our program. So sure. <laughs> lose either way. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Good times. Good times. <laughs> let's, let's pivot uh, to urban farming. Um, we t- you know, you spent time cutting your teeth in, in Boston and uh, now have moved to Soul Fire Farm. And yet, you know, so many predictions point towards more and more of the population moving to cities. You talk in the book about uh, African Americans going from uh, from the South to the Great Migration, uh, to redlining, and eventually the first community gardens, and about um, you know people like uh, Hattie Carthen who basically planted every tree in Bed Stuy in New York. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, what is what what does the future of, of urban farming look like? Has it moved to you know the rooftops, and and where are the opportunities for for black farmers to work the soil or or raise chickens? Yeah, I mean, I think urban farming is really crucial for some of those reasons that you started to allude to. Um, One is that most of us black and brown folks are living in urban areas in the United States because of that history of um, race-based oppression in the rural spaces in the South, where people literally were driven out of their homes with fire and gunshots and their land was taken. Um, And so it makes sense that we would want to and need to, you know, eke out our little plot of land wherever we can find it, whether that's on a patio or rooftop or a corner lot community garden. And it's absolutely essential. You know, Cuba, of course, is a model of this where in Havana and and other places, they're able to uh, do this biointensive farming in a way that actually contributes, uh, you know, a significant percentage of the food security for that region. At the same time, uh, just surely doing the math of like, you know, productivity per square foot, we're not going to be able to feed the world on urban farming. And so I think sometimes those who would be very eager, including many retirement funds and hedge funds, very eager to just grab up all of the land in the rural landscape and have those resources for themselves, they'll encourage us to uh, piddle around with our vertical gardens. And, and we actually need the land back. We need a wholesale land reform in the United States. You know, 98% yeah. of the rural and land is white controlled because of a whole legacy of theft and exclusion. And true food security is going to be a combination of, of those urban farms and, and our rural landscape becoming productive and in the, in the hands of the wider community. 98% of the land is owned by white people. Yep. Yeah. But, 17 but, but, USDA census, 98% of the yeah. arable land is white Jesus controlled, which is a higher Christ. percentage than ever before in our history. What was the wow. peak uh, black ownership of land? Do you know? Yeah, it was 1910. So 1910 was the peak of black land ownership at around 16 million acres. And again, not because of 40 acres and a mule, that was a broken promise, but because sharecroppers saved up their money over two generations to be able to purchase those um, lands. And immediately there was a fierce backlash uh, by the White Caps, the Ku Klux Klan, and later the White Citizens Council that drove black farmers off of their land. And what person, so you said 16 million acres, what do you have any idea? And sorry, I realize you're not Google. What is, <laughs> what is, uh, what was the percentage of ownership? What does 16 million acres get you in, in 1920? So it was uh, 14% of the nation's farms by number. I don't know by acres. Gotcha. Okay. And well, we're I down mean, to less than 2% of the nation's farms being uh, black controlled. Sort of a follow up basically to what, what I was just asking. How, how much are cities discriminatory? zoning practices uh, affecting the ability to to set up new new community gardens and urban farms? 
Oh, that's such a complicated history because, in fact, you know, if for folks who don't know, in the 1930s, the federal government uh, commissioned all these maps to be made that ranked neighborhoods from most desirable to lend to down to worst mm-hmm. in terms of risk. And banks would not lend to the communities outlined in red, which were communities of color. Uh, it's known as redlining. And that resulted in, in generations of divestment of um, uh, predatory lending and so forth in the black and brown community and led to the wealth gap we have today, which is 16 mm-hmm. to 1 uh, white to black, meaning that a, a white child born in America today is 16 times wealthier when they draw their first breath than a black child born today. All that to say, the communities that were redlined um, were the ones that experienced the biggest decline um, in the 1980s, especially in the Northeast and uh, fires and the um, you know vacant lots. And it were it were were elders in the community, um, in the black community, in the Latinx community, who took those lots and turned them into beautiful community gardens. Um, and you can see an almost perfect overlay of the redlining maps and the community garden maps. Right? It was quite ironic. But then, All of right. course, Bloomberg, you know, uh, and other leaders in New York City would take these now beautified neighborhoods and then um, sell off the gardens to developers. And and so gentrification became the next wave of displacement. Uh, and, and people are, are resisting. They've always resisted. But I think that <laughs> that history of undervaluing um, black and brown residents of a city certainly contributes to a lack of ability to hold on to um, property, whether that's for housing or for gardening. Yeah. I mean, e- even if redlining is quote unquote over, I mean, the, the lasting impact is just shocking. I mean, it shouldn't I, I be shocking. You think it's over, and at the same time, right. go on Zillow.com, you will still right. see those same neighborhoods outlined in red as bad neighborhoods, which is just mind-boggling to me. You know, And even if you're a professional like two-income household in Detroit, you can't get a mortgage. You can get a mortgage in the suburbs. So while it is illegal since 1977, wow. it continues mm-hmm. in fact, you know, that de facto segregation where black and brown folks are still pretty stuck in the same zip codes. Leah, I'm a I'm a science nerd, clearly, who does this, but I was a liberal arts major, and I was actually religious studies major, uh, even though I'm just kind of like a relatively pagan atheist. But so I love the te- I love the technical parts of the book. From uh, I mean, you you've got this thing; it's such an incredible instruction manual, business plans and seeds, medicinal plants. I loved uh, chapter three, honoring the spirits of the land, and the, the quote. In African cosmology, we believe there's no separation between the sacred and the everyday. And I thought about that a lot because when I first started studying quote unquote religion, I was I was really taken aback to find that most of the world's religious devotional practices is is nothing really like the typical white Western version of you you, you know, you go to like Catholic church for a couple hours on Sunday and get yelled at. It's it's every day, <laughs> it's every hour. It's in waking up and cooking and planting and eating and going to sleep. Um, so I wonder if you can talk to me a little bit about how farming with intention and ritual provide for a better farm and farmer. Um, besides, as you, as you said in the chapter, <laughs> how you, be- you benefit from fewer tick bites and poison ivy. <laughs> I feel like I'll need to explain that as well. But um yeah, so I actually just got back from Ghana last week where I went to go visit my teachers who are the Manya Krobo Queen Mothers of the Eastern Region. And um, I've been back four times now and, and the first time lived there for about six months and learned to farm from them and learned a whole lot about life and what really matters. Uh, but one of the things that they said to me the first time I was there was, you know, Leah, is it really true that in the United States, a farmer will put a seed in the ground and they won't pray or dance or sing or pour libations or even say thank you to the earth. And then they expect the seed to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Of course that is the case. Right. And they mm-hmm. said, well, that's why you, what, that's why you're all sick. You know, you're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not sure. relative. And uh, that has shaped my whole way of being on the land. You know, and at first I kept pretty private. I would, go uh, do a little divination to ask the earth if it was okay to, you know, move some soil from here to there, or I would do my prayers of gratitude. And as people started coming to programs, they'd be peering over my shoulder, like, what do you, what do you got going on over there? <laughs> you know, how can sure. we get in on that? And now it's become quite integrated. You know, of course it's optional. We don't evangelize our beliefs in any way, but, um, you know, after folks, for example, transition a chicken from field to freezer, there's a sure. ceremony of spiritual bath that is that's done in Vodun. And, um, and we offer that and people have found it 
very, very meaningful and very healing to connect what they're doing in the physical realm to what's happening in the, in the spiritual realm with their ancestors and with these forces of nature. How is that? Uh, like you said, it's, it's, it's optional, but I, I'm curious how that's received as people come to, for example, the, the one week program. Is, is there a lot of intake of this part of the program? Is it, is it widely celebrated? I, I'm, I'm curious because people, like you said, come from all walks of life to attend. Yeah, they do come from all walks of life. And, and as I mentioned, it wasn't something I was even going to share with folks, but it was by popular demand and almost everyone participates. I mean, something that, that I think is different too between um, the Abrahamic religions and some of these indigenous religions is that we have this concept of inclusion. Um, so for example, when we think about the deities, the forces of nature, which are called Arisha or Loa, we have a concept that there's 400 plus one of them because we always want to leave room for um, encountering the sacred among our neighbors and people we meet and making space for that within our cosmology. So in Haiti, you know, there's a saying that the country is like 90% Catholic, 10% Protestant, and 100% voodoo, meaning that there's, <laughs> it's okay. Like all of this can be compatible. There's not a sense of, um, of exclusion or, or that you have to just pick one path. And, and so I think folks have found that it's quite possible for them to revere their ancestors in the land while being Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, or, you know, whatever faith they're bringing with them. I mean that that's about as inclusive as it yeah, gets. What an idea. I think in 2020, where all yeah. we try to do is is separate people. That's that's pretty special. So awesome. Yeah, I, I always like- think about like how mad those priests must have been in Haiti when um, you know, like the traditional traditionalists are practicing their um, ceremonies and praying to Ogun and Esli Dantor and all the different deities, and they and then they add Jesus in, and <laughs> the priests are like, what? Jesus is wait a minute, in, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Jesus is welcome too, along with all of these other, you know, powerful forces. So, yeah, right. <laughs> I love that. Hey, how did you, just keeping on this note for one more minute, you mentioned, I believe you said your grandfather was Haitian. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, Samuel Cornelius Smith um, came to the United States from Haiti as a teenager and um, really powerful ancestor and dear, dear person to me. You know, he would check my report cards when I went to visit to make sure it was straight A's and then let me into the house. And then a <laughs> bonus let me into, uh, he was an engineer, worked for NASA. And uh, I would check out all of his patents and inventions in the basement. And remember this, the smell of those uh, erasers and rubber bands that permeated the, <laughs> the workshop. Really good man. Oh, that's so cool. How did, how, how did voodoo ritual make its way into your life? Was it, was it from him or was it always there? Almost certainly not. No, um, like so many Caribbean immigrants, he worked really hard to uh, assimilate into Black American culture. And so we mm-hmm. didn't even really eat the foods, maybe plantains once in a while, but we didn't eat any soup jumu or derriac pois, any of those foods. And so it was after the 2010 earthquake that my sister and I, along with so many Haitian Americans, felt like we needed to do something, you know, or rekindle that relationship that we went back to uh, the town where our family was from and, and started to build with the farmers there. And so I've been to Haiti now, oh, at least seven times, um, since 2010 uh-huh. and, uh, work on projects with, with the farmers there. And through that learned about, uh, Haitian voodoo, as well as, you know, the farming practices, the food and, and culture. It's pretty special. It's, it's really so compelling to find something like that. Um, you know, not, not later in life as if we're ancient, but you know what I mean? Like, it, <laughs> the, you know, it's like, it's like making a new best friend at, at, at 40 where you're like, it's incredible. Like that this person and I are so close and yet we didn't know each other. We lived entire lives before each other. You know, you, you would think traditionally that you have to meet these people at 12 or something to have that sort of relationship. I love that um, metaphor of thinking about this relationship with Aizzi as a best friend. That's beautiful. Are you saying that you've, just replace me as a best friend, by the way. Long story. Okay. Because that we, we can talk, talk about, about that. We can All talk right. about it later. Sorry, Leah. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You should be sorry. But you work that out after the call. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Leah, what is the, what is the next, you know, 10, 10 years of, of soul fire farm look like? Uh, and, and the ten, next 10 years of black farming and, you know, who, who are some of the other leaders out there like, like yourself and, and Karen Washington, of course, that we can all help lift up. 
Oh my goodness, that was so many questions in one. So I think that um, that's I think our favorite thing to do. Here. Sorry, <laughs> ask twenty questions. <laughs> I, at I the can same keep time. track of all of them. I will do my best. Um, so our goal is that by twenty fifty, which is more than ten years from now, that um, U.S. black farmers will regeneratively steward a hundred thousand farms on ten million acres of land. So that's um, more than doubling where we are now, and that society will support us for this honorable work. Um, I think that Soul Fire Farm's part in that will be determined by what our community is asking us for. Uh, but I predict that we'll continue to be leaders in the training, equipping, and supporting of that next generation or, or what we call the returning generation of Black farmers, the people whose grandparents and great-grandparents uh, fled the land for good reason and, and those who are now realizing that we left a bit of our souls and culture behind that we need to reclaim and, and move forward with. I think that some of the leaders that we need to be looking out for, both organizationally and individually, include the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, which is an org that we are incubating right now um, and is working very actively on the rematriation of land to indigenous communities, as well as the reparations gifts of land to black and brown farmers. And that organization is up and coming and already is building a list of people who want to give their acres back and do the right thing. Um, so you definitely reach out and get involved with that. There's also a reparations map um, online at Soul Fire Farms webpage, as well as the Northeast Farmers of Color webpage that has uh, projects all around the country that need resources. The other org that I'll uplift is the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, which is working nationally um, to move capital and technical assistance and land in the direction of Black farmers and food businesses. Um, and they're super dope and grassroots. Uh, and accountable to all of us. And so check them out and support them as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, we will definitely put all that in the show notes yes. uh, for sure. So people can check that out. I, I think about like you've mentioned, you know, all these incredible groups that, that already exist, uh, you know, that can help get to the point of, 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 of doubling, you know, the land, like you said, um, and, 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 and farming it in, in a regenerative way that accomplishes so many things at once um and it made me think of uh, of two things one are, how, how familiar are you are you following along with uh the sort of evolution of this green new deal idea and how uh environmental justice is uh, a part of it well um we helped to draft some of the language um so we're part of a nice called the Farmers and Ranchers for a Green New Deal, among other coalitions, but um, working really close with AOC's staff um, and other legislators to make sure that there's an equity component. Because um, to be super honest, the first round like mentioned Indigenous and Black people, but didn't say what we right. were going to do about it. Um, right. And so we're re really excited to see the evolution of that to make sure that um, it's not just what's happening with the land, but it's who gets to be part of that. And it's not just that there are green jobs, but it's who's getting those green jobs and who's defining uh, what they are. Um, and so uh, we're hopeful about that. We think the very survival of the species and all of our non-human siblings depends on um, this piece of legislation and, and legislation like it. And so we're we're all for it. I love that. Um, Rihanna Gunn Wright was one of our earlier conversations. Um, I'm not sure you're, if you're familiar with her. She's uh, one of the architects behind the thing as well. And, uh, and we had a great conversation about how it's so, she, not surprisingly, just continues to get and has for her, her being involved in this thing, so much shit from generally old white guys who are like, well, we can, we have to wait on the justice part. We don't have to do that part yet. And she's like, well, no, it mm. has to happen now. It has to be a part of it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Otherwise, exactly. it's pointless. And, you know, she talks about how going home to Detroit, you know, like you said, it's not about green jobs. It's about who gets them. And, she, you know, she says, I am res I'm responsible to those people I'm going back to, my family and my friends and, and my home to, to say that, you know, mm -hmm. exactly. you, were you were not just considered, but we're an instrumental part of this thing. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're just doing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. And you look at who's most impacted by climate chaos already. You know, it's the farmers who are suffering from heat strokes and it's the folks in the Caribbean who are, are losing all their crops because of, um, you know, extreme weather events and so forth. And you also look at who's at the front lines of, of making the changes and who always has been. You know, it was European yeah. settlers who uh, drove 50 percent of the organic carbon out of the soil within uh, one generation of tillage in the 1800s, right? And it's indigenous and black folks are putting it back. And so so right. both in terms of who's impacted, but also who really 
knows those solutions um, intimately because they're part of our heritage. Um, it, it can't happen. It, you know, it, you cannot um, use the master's tools, right, to dismantle the master's house. We have to fundamentally uh, reconsider how we're approaching uh, the earth. I mean, I mean, we do. And, and that makes me come back to something I was just thinking about when you talk about who, who knows the solutions. I mean, among the just infinite number of, of, of tragedies that, that have come from uh, and continue to result from slavery and institutional racism and Jim Crow and more is, is this notion that we have, you know, s- silenced voices that could have otherwise change the world in, in some way, in so many different ways. And, and um, I, I jotted down, you started off the chapter on, on youth and land with this, the great Frederick Douglass quote, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And that feels like in, in 2020, that quote means so much more than it ever has because the children are, are you know, not because they want to, are, are taking charge. I mean, they can't vote. They can't run companies yet. And they are saying, we we are going to do this because you you have failed and i'm and and what's so great about that coalition is is how colorful it is and how many people are being brought in and it, it's not perfect by any stretch you know we're there there are so many young women doing the exact same things that Greta Van Thunberg is um and they're not getting the coverage that she is um but but hopefully we are starting to make some strides there um but it feels like today in the in this moment where we need I mean, we need, it is, it is quite literally all hands on deck, right? We need every idea. We need every set of hands and every brain and, and skill set. I mean, it just seems, I mean, how foolish would it be to, to, to continue to purposefully silence a segment of, of the population that, like you said, who knows the solutions? I mean, so it's like, what if, despite them owing us exactly nothing. And by them, I mean, people of color owing white people exact nothing. You know, if the spaceship showed up, <laughs> I mean, we, we, you guys, oh, oh, nothing. We, we've ruined the whole thing. But if we actually let, you know, those people rise to the top or even more so, so support and encourage them. So, so I just want to guess what I'm saying is I want to get to the bottom of like, how, how can we best do that? How, how can we help? Mm. That's so beautiful. And I really appreciate to um, acknowledgement of how distributed the leadership has been. And it's not always what the media can cover. And at the same time, we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. We really do need um, everyone's ideas and, you know, mal for Greta and, and then all the rest. So as far as how to support, you know, there's a, this will seem like a circuitous story, but I think it drives the point home. It's Please, like, that's my entire job. <laughs> you know, I feel like in so many movements, it's really obvious who we should listen to and, and, and defer to what we should do. You know, if we want to work on Islamophobia, obviously we are going to um, listen to what the Muslim community is saying is needed. You know, if we want to work on uh, veterans supporting them with PTSD, we're going to listen to the veterans community. And then when it comes to racial justice, uh, folks get real confused sometimes. And, you know, I work in food, of course, and, um, and it's so often to see white led organizations and individuals uh, doing things like deciding that a, a black community really needs kale salad recipe classes in their kindergarten and then they write a grant to pay themselves to go benevolently you know go teach these kale salad classes and nobody wants the nasty kale salad and 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 they didn't ask for it and and none of those resources uh from philanthropy are actually making it to that community and and so i guess the overarching answer to that question is we need to follow the lead of the people most impacted and do what they're asking us to do. And sometimes that will look like providing childcare or coffee or interpretation at their gatherings. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be steering the ship all the time. Um, and there are so many organizations on the front lines, and we've taken the time over the past couple of years to compile a list of hundreds of them. And you can go to soulfirefarm.org slash take action and see a list of organizations that need support that are working in food and climate and environment. Um, but give them what you have. You know, if you know funders, introduce them. You know, if you have land, mm-hmm. give it away. If you have, you have money, give it away. A meeting space, offer it for free. A, a big need right now is fiscal sponsorship. We need uh, nonprofits who will give these grassroots organizations no cost fiscal sponsorship so that they can leverage funding. Um, but there's all of those suggestions we have um, on our website. Um, but fundamentally, it's really about um, passing the mic, passing the oars, and and switching to a support role. I love that. I, I think 
I mean, that seems to be the 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 most important main theme, which is get comfortable quickly switching to the support role. Right. Mm-hmm. Let, let's talk about uh, trauma for, for a second. You you mentioned it in the book. Um, you know, it's not always pretty when people show up at the farm. H- how often are are the folks that come out affected by the trauma of, of so many generations past? Oh, I would say 100% of black and brown wow. people are affected by trauma, both of generations past and the ongoing onslaught yeah. of racism, like microaggressions and structural racism and exclusion, 100%, absolutely. You know, but specifically the trauma of um, land-based oppression, you know, enslavement, sharecropping, and so forth. Uh, it's still the majority. I, I don't know of any youth group that's ever come here and someone hasn't mentioned within the first five minutes, like, oh, you all a bunch of slaves or like, what's going on here? And, Whoa. All right, because we're hundreds of stuff, yeah, but that's the image. Um, right. And I think what's been so important for me to learn, though, is that just as the, the land was the scene of the crime, as my friend Chris Bolden Newsom would say, you know, she was never the criminal. And in fact, mm. she was probably what kept us going. You know, we believe in, in West African cosmology that the land is a source of wisdom and belonging and truth, is uh, able to compost trauma into hope, is the home of our ancestors and, and, and more. And so when people come to the farm, there's not actually a ton we have to do actively as humans to heal that trauma. Just being on the land by choice and in an environment that's safe and supportive and culturally relevant, like the healing just starts happening. Um, which is amazing for young people and for adults. Uh, sounds incredible. That's special. Jeez. Leah, goal at the end of these conversations uh, uh, is to provide specific action steps that our listeners can take um, to support you and your mission uh, with their voice, their vote, and their dollar. So let's chat about that. Um, uh, let's start with, with, with voice. What are, what are the big actionable, specific questions that we we should all be asking um, of our representatives uh, uh, in support of you and what you're doing. Mm, that's great. So like voice and vote kind of combined. So mm-hmm. asking our representatives, we should ask them to support the Fairness for Farm Workers Act. So um, just for a little bit of background, uh, farm workers do not have the same protections under the law as other workers since the 1930s, meaning no overtime. Mm. Hey, no right to a day off in seven, no right to unionize, limited child labor protections, limited um, sexual harassment protections. That needs to change. Like, yeah, what yes, the hell? What the hell? It's 2020, right? So fairness for farm wow. work. The next thing we need to talk about is land. Why the hell is 98% of the rural land owned by white people? Why are the reservations shrinking? Um, why do we still have fractionated Indian lands? Why are black farmers literally losing their land to foreclosure by the U.S. government under the Medicaid program? And the USDA program, so the government's taking land from Black farmers. We got to deal with that. And the third thing that I would say um, we need to talk to our representatives about is the Green New Deal and making sure that uh, we have a climate healing agenda front and center, um, and that is following the the voices and wisdom of the people most impacted by climate change, who are Black, Brown, Indigenous people. Um, there's a full policy platform on our website, soulfirefarm.org. So let's take action. Of course, there is. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, a hundred more bills and things. It gets pretty obscure. And then as far as dollar, you know, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but uh, we have a reparations map, which shouts out over a hundred different black and brown led projects across the country that need anything from a hug to a tractor to 40 acres. And if there's one near you, you can contribute um, or you, of course, contribute can contribute to Soul Fire Farm because in order to keep our doors open, we have to build a uh, new septic system. So uh, any help with a uh, safe disposal of our poop is is welcome. Um, and, uh, and you, <laughs> you can reach out to us for even more if you, if you need more things to do. Um, that's awesome. I love all the resources that you, yeah, uh, that already put together. Awesome. That is, that is super helpful. Wow. And, uh, we will absolutely, uh, point people in that direction. We're getting close to time here. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, who are some other game changers like yourself that we should talk to? Not necessarily in uh, farming or soil, but people who, inspire you who are on the front lines uh, that people need to hear for they're out there doing the work changing the world oh my goodness there's so many um i'll shout out today jermaine jenkins at fresh future farm in charleston um she's just so badass i mean someone who 
is a mother who herself was relying on emergency food, who turned around and started building gardens in these uh, neighborhoods and, and now is a national voice. Um, super duper amazing. I would shout out Mai Nguyen um, of the National Young Farmers Coalition, who's a rice farmer and advocate for um, South Asian and other uh, racialized communities um, on the West Coast. And I'll give my last shout out to Baba Malik Yakini in Detroit, who turned seven acres of abandoned land into a farm and food co-op um, by and for the Black community. Um, so check out their work. And, and you can tell them all for the grassroots, of course. Yeah, I love wow. it. Literally and metaphorically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, are you ready, Leah, for the don't call it a lightning round? Brian has told me I'm contractually obligated not to call this a lightning round. He calls round. this a lightning round, and it's, it's, not, like it's just the last long questions. questions. It's not, I don't understand. There's four questions, oh, it's they're like not four very long. Questions? Is that the idea? It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of the idea. Yeah. It's gotten away from us. Um, Leah, <laughs> when was the first time in your life when you realized you had the power of change, the power to do something meaningful? 1985. Damn. Wow. <laughs> Did you uh. say what it was? Or just, just a one word answer. No, you you are obligated to now tell us what it was. Just say when it is does. the time. I'll change the question. What okay, no, I can answer. I get, I get it now. I get how it works. So my <laughs> sister and I, as five and six year olds, on our red, on our um, red and blue happy bicycles, came across some loggers that were cutting down our favorite play area in the forest. Oh. And my sister, who continues to be very badass and brave, went right up to them and told them to stop cutting down her friends. Um, and I think they were so tickled by this incident that they actually moved away from our play area. <laughs> what? Like, what? Really? Sort of change. Yes. Wow. That is so rad. By our friends. God. What if everybody was that amazing and knew how important the earth was? Can you imagine this place? Oh, no. It would be, a, it would be beautiful. <laughs> were you, real quick, were you the red or the uh uh, blue I bike. was blue, and I was also silent. I'm much more timid than my sister, um, Naima, who continues to uh, speak truth to power. Awesome. That's rock and roll. Um, that is so cool. Uh, Leah, who is someone in your... Oh, wait, you know what? Before us, on the topic of the trees, cutting down your friends, have you heard of um, Dr. Suzanne Simard? Mm, not by name. Okay, so <laughs> check this lady out. Okay. She... <laughs> She's a professor, oh man, somewhere in Canada. East, oh, she's University not the, the trees speak to each she's other. She's the tree lady. Oh, she's the one who discovered yeah. that the trees act, literally talk to each other and defend each other and all that stuff. Yeah, she's got a great TED talk. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. It's the she's coolest a- stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, okay. Um, Leah, who is someone in your life that's positively impacted your work in the past six months? Ooh, um, my best friend... Uh, Babalao Anru Halfpenny, who always reminds me that even if I didn't didn't do one more thing with my life, um, I'm still worthy of the air I breathe. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, we need people like that, especially our Type A uh, overworked personalities. Need people to remind us that we're good enough just being. There is no one worse at telling themselves things like that than this guy. It'd be very nice if you told me something like that, Quinn. <laughs> Every Wait, can we just talk while. about it later? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what they always say, right? Which is like, how would you talk to your best friend when when they were feeling down or that they're not doing enough? Like, treat your treat yourself that way. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm so I, I I feel lucky that you have someone like that in your life because I think we all benefit from you having someone like that in your life. That's very <laughs> special. It is. Yeah, it is very special. Um, hey, Leah, what do you do when you feel overwhelmed? What's your self care? Um, I wish, yes, yes, it's very important. I'm a very, very bad self care role model. I would say the one thing that I do consistently is um, whenever there's first light, I go on a run, at least 5K run, and let my mind do whatever it wants to do. That's yeah, pretty that's great. Pretty great self care. Awesome. Wow. Bring it um, home. Bring it home, did you say? Yeah. I'm going to bring it home. Leah. If you could Amazon, we have a uh, we have an Amazon <laughs> Prime lit like book club list on Amazon, uh, and these this your answer will be added to that list. Uh, oh. If you get Amazon Prime one book to Donald Trump, what what would it be? <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Usual conditions apply. Someone would have to read it to him. Probably. It, we've gotten coloring books, constitu- I mean, the whole thing. There's no I mean, answer. So my first thought is actually not a book at all. It's like some sort of magical wanga that would like neutralize um, his objections. <laughs> <But> anyway, <laughs> it, it would probably be um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Awesome. Well, Fantastic. I also hope there's that other book on Amazon yeah, that I'll, we can I'll send him. Some things inside <laughs> <of> it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. Outers. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's amazing. All right. Last thing. Anything else you would like to say? Uh, speak truth to power uh, to get out to our listeners that, that we haven't asked any questions we should have asked. Uh, I guess I'll just end with a shout out to um, an ancestor who influences me greatly. Who's Fannie Lou Hamer uh, of the many brilliant things she said. She said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup can for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to say or do. And that is my prayer for food sovereignty for all of our peoples. That is super fucking cool. Um, Leah, where awesome. can our listeners follow you on the internet, if at all? Oh, yeah. Uh, you can follow us at Soul Fire Farm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then occasionally we post on Farming Well Black as well. Check that out, too. Awesome. Rock and roll. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time today and your consideration and thoughtfulness and obviously everything else yeah, you're doing your existence. besides this conversation for all that you're doing. we uh, the, the world needs folks like you not sure we deserve you um but but we pledge to do as much as we can to to support you and and all the people you talked about who are also doing amazing things out there so thank you oh thank you it's been a blast and i really appreciate y'all's integrity oh well you say that now um (laughs) awesome well have a great good luck with the snow yeah it's 85 degrees here Um, yeah good luck with the sun we, everything's yeah, gonna be fine it. everything's fine everything's fine all right leah have a great rest of your day thank you so much all right, peace. thanks to our incredible guest today and thanks to all of you for tuning in we hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant as a reminder please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com it is all the news most vital to our survival as a species and you can follow us all over the internet you can find us on twitter at important not imp <sighs> just it's so weird also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks.